அலமதுல்லாஹிரபிலாலமின் வசலாத்து வசலாம் அல அஷ்ரஃபி லம்பியாய் வல் முர்சலீம் அல அலிஹி வசாஹி அஜ்மாயின் ஒன் ஷாது அல்லா இல்ல இல்ல வாஹூ அஹ்தூ அல்லா ஷரீக் அல்லா ஒன் ஷாது அன்ன முஹம்மது நம்தூஹு வ ரசூலுஹு ரபிஷ்ராஹ்லி சதுரி வயசர் லி அம்ரி வாஹ்லுத்தன் மின் லிசானி அஃப் கவு கவுலி சுபஹான கல சுபான கலா இல் மலனா இல்ல ம ஆலம் தனா இன்ன கான் தல அலீம் உல் ஹக்கீம் ஒன் அவுது பில்லாஹி மின் ஷைத்வானி ரஜீம் பிஸ்மில்லாஹி ரஹ்மானி ரஹீம் வி ஃபினிஷ் லாஸ்ட் வீக்ஸ் Musa and Al-Khidr's event and throughout the whole event I said that understanding Musa and Al-Khidr is the foundation of now understanding Dhul Qarnain because what is highlighted by this event of Musa and Al-Khidr is equally highlighted in the procedures that Dhul Qarnain takes if you only look at the surface of Dhul Qarnain's story as a story it presents itself as something that is phantasmal amazing the fiats and adventures that he goes through but there is a much more deeper purpose embedded with dul karnain and what he actually does and that when it comes to eschatology ultimately leads us to understanding who are ya juj and ma juj and why are they a global sign not just as far as the muslims are concerned but global their legend is mentioned in christian theology it is in judaic theology it is even there in hindu theology it even goes back to chinese buddhist theology they are a people who are a blanket over the earth when it comes to the end of times their progress is not a progress that starts off randomly or spontaneously and then just dies out just as random and spontaneous as it is because that is what is perceived but when you understand the methodology that goes around it how who are they psychologically who are they descriptively what is their their characteristic prime characteristic and attribution and why are they a sign of the end of times when it comes to end of times when we say the end of the world the the phrase the end of the world is a conventional phrase it is something that we are using in speech but it is not the end of the world the world is not going anywhere the world is where it is and it will progress as it has been ordained to progress it is the end of human history it is humanity that is going to end the world will stay where it is and humanity is going to end the way it will end based on its own actions allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that it is due to your own actions that the calamity befalls upon you it is because of what you do because he has already given us the right means he has given us the guidance with which to follow and if you adhere to that guidance then the end is going to transpire in a harmonious way you will have a good ending and likewise when you as a collective people as a race as a species do not follow that guidance then it will end in the tragedy you will have a bad ending to the epic of humanity and he is saying that because every action that we perform we are responsible for it he has put the means with which to follow and those are part and parcel of the guidance he has given us but he has also given us as i mentioned abilities and capabilities one of those abilities is responsibility the definition of responsibility is to have the ability to respond when you are questioned so being responsible is having a response when you are questioned for a duty or a charge that you have been given that is why you are responsible and this responsibility is something that because he has put the means and ways there for you for you to use to unfold your life and move forward individually and holistically as a race there is no one to blame but yourself because you cannot blame the means and you cannot blame any additional influences you can only blame yourself 
Musa and Al Khidr, when Khidr went through the three stages, there were there is the epistemological side of those three stages. But if you really look deeper into his actions, you will find that he doesn't do anything on his own accord. He uses the means that Allah has put forth for him. He uses the sabab, and that is what I said was tawakkal Allah, have trust in Allah. But then you tie your camel, you use the means so that you can have a favorable outcome. The ulama identify three major categories of these means. And then there are all the subparticles. The three universals of these means are uh, knowledge, power, and instruments. Ilm, Qudra, and Ala. The knowledge that he gives you, how do you utilize that knowledge? The power and ability that he gives you, the rank that he gives you, how do you use that power and ability? And then the instruments and tools and all other objects that he has put at your disposal, how do you use those objects? There's a philosophy that says the pen is mightier than the sword. On a very causal level, it is justifiable that the pen is mightier than the sword. Why? Because it is easier to draw peace than it is to spread bloodshed. It is better and more fruitful and beneficial to have peace and diplomatic relations than to cause bloodshed and war. But a deeper philosophy behind that is that the pen is not mighty, neither is the sword mighty. Mighty is the one who knows when to use the pen and when to use the sword. The mighty is the one who knows when to ink the pen and when to draw the sword, because those are just the instruments. How you use them will determine the outcomes forward, because there are times in the world of causality when the sword is necessary when conflict is necessary. And then there are times when diplomacy is necessary. When you look at Dhul Karnain, you will find that his key descriptive is that he uses the means he has been given. And he's not only given the means, he's also tested by those means. So that when power race rests on the foundation of faith, power is tested to the brink. When knowledge rests on the foundation of faith, it will definitely be tested. And every means made available to you, your usage of them will be tested and you will be responsible for your actions. When it comes, when now Dhulqarnain, if you look at the descriptives of Dhulqarnain, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not mention his name. He doesn't give you his lineage or his genealogy. He gives him a title, Dhul Qarnain, and there are numerous uh, scholastic disputes and opinions as to who Dhul Qarnain is historically, trying to find a historical figure who fits his profile. I'm not going to go into all those details because it's just way too long. It's too broad. Personally, I don't feel anybody should even bother going into those details because the Quranic epistemology is very clear. It's not who he is that matters by name and disc by, 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 by name and, and lineage. It's what he did that matters. That's the lesson you draw. This is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not mention his name. He gives a title and a title is a descriptive based on his attribute. And the same case applies to Al-Khidr. His name is not given. His lineage is not given. It's a title, and the title is based on his attribute and his description. Fakhruddin al-Razi gives in his tafsir 10 possible meanings of Dhul Qarnain. Not the name Dhul Qarnain, the title Dhul Qarnain. What does Dhul Qarnain mean? Linguistically, in the Arabic, Dhul Qarnain simply means the possessor of, number one, a Qarn can be horn, so it could be the possessor of two horns. A Qarn can also relate to time. So it could be the, pos the, the possessor of two ages or two epochs. Um, Qaran can also mean, and this is a de definition that is given in the Hadith, uh, the edges or boundaries of human civilization. So one of the descriptives of the Qarnain is that he traveled to two ends of the land. It was not the physical land as to the furthest western point or to the furthest eastern point. It was insofar as how far human civilization was inhabiting the world at that point. And it was to those two extremes that he went to. 
this is a more suitable definition because it is in the hadith number one and it describes the two journeys that he made and we'll look at how these two journeys define the two extremities of human civilization and you will also find that he is tested on each extreme the jews who questioned about Dhul Karnain, they hid the name or the title about concerning whom they were questioning. They asked about the great traveler who journeyed to two ends of the land. You find the rhetoric of the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is undoubtedly smarter than his creation. He calls out their, 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 what they are hiding, what they are concealing. He calls it out, brings, calls out their bluff. When they asked about the companions of the cave and, and they say, tell us about the companions of the cave for theirs is a wondrous tale. Even though he didn't re re repeat the question, he called it out of them. He asked, Am hasibta anna ashab al kafi wa raqimi. He mentioned one more thing in there that they seem to have concealed deliberately in their question. Are you did you think that the, the companions of the cave and the Raqim Kanu min ayatina ajaba? Did you think they were wondrous? That they're amongst our signs was the most amazement of, of our signs. He repeats the question by calling out their bluff. And he does the same thing with Dhul Karnain, but he does it on a much deeper level. Because there's something that they concealed in this third question that has over 2000 years since they were banished from the Holy Land now materialized in the world today. And the evidence is plain and clear insofar as the Jewish agenda is concerned. Dulkarnain's three journeys eventually leads to Ya'juj and Ma'juj. And there is only one other place that Gog and Magog are mentioned in the Quran. And this is where Surah al kahf will have the links. It is the opening of eschatological study and then you now follow the links to different parts of the Quran and you put the dots together. The only other place of mention of Ya'juj and Ma'juj is in Surah Al-Anbiya between ayah number 95 and 97. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first speaks of a Qariya and again when we go back to Al-Khidr you will you remember I mentioned I spoke about the difference between a Qariya and Medina and why that difference was explicitly put there. He says, وَحَرَامٌ عَلَىٰ قَرْيَةٍ أَحْلَكْنَاهَا أَنَّهُمْ لَا يَرْجِعُونَ It is forbidden on the people of a town which we destroyed, a town that we, we destroyed, a qarya that we destroyed, that its people, أَنَّهُمْ, its people, لَا يَرْجِعُونَ are not allowed to return to it. There is no raja for them. They have been banned. They have been kicked out of that town. And this takes you to the link of Surah Al-Isra, the first eight ayah of Surah Al-Isra. It was told to them in the Torah, you are going to cause corruption on two occasions. And the first occasion was when they broke Nabi Sulaiman's kingdom and they disputed over who, to, who is going to uh, inherit the kingdom. And they fell back into their transgressions. They went into idol worshipping. They started bringing out all these ancient demons and jinn whom they used to appease as gods. They built idols out of them. They went into witchcraft and sorcery that laid the foundation of what they now call the Kabbalic practice. What they refer to as the mysticism of Judaism. It's not mysticism. It's witchcraft. It's sorcery. I have studied the book. I have studied the Kabbalah cover to cover and it has caused me nightmares to see what is in there, particularly when they are referring to the Torah as the foundation of what they have done. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent the Babylonian army to put them in their place. And when they were enslaved for 70 years and they wept by the rivers of Babylon, you know the song by the rivers of Babylon? Uh, you remember the song, 70s, 80s song? It's actually from, from, the, from the Zohar, by the rivers of Babylon, there we wept. There we sat, there we wept, when we remembered Zion. And, when they, when, and that is the time when Allah communicated an important message to them. 
that there will come a savior who will help you back. This is where this, the legend of Cyrus the Great comes in, the Persian conqueror who conquered the lands of Persia first, which were Media, going back in the historical genealogy of the Semitic people. Madai was a son of Yafit, who married the daughter of Sham, Yafit's brother. Nu had three, brother, uh, three sons, four sons, one of them perished before the flood or, or during the flood. Ham, Sham and Yafit. And we'll go into those genealogies. Madai was one of Yafit's son who married Sham's daughter and he did not want to live in his father's land. So he was given the land of Madai to whom later on uh, through time the prophet Shuaib was sent to the people of Madian. So after now, after uh, Suleiman salam's kingdom was broken, Cyrus the Great conquered Madia first, liberated it. And then he conquered Lydia, what was what then became Anatolia, which is now modern day Turkey. So he first conquered modern day Iran, and then he conquered modern day Turkey. And then he went further south, and then he conquered Babylon, which is Iraq in, in, in today's time. And he freed the Jews, he allowed them to return back to rebuild now what was the second temple. It's called the second temple age of the Jews. The first temple or masjid was built by Suleiman. The second was built by them under the uh, governance of King Herod. But when Nabi Isa was sent to them as the savior, who was the right savior for them, they rejected him. And the transgressions that they performed upon Nabi Isa salam, the historicities are there. We know this from a Muslim perspective as well of what they did to this Prophet of Allah. This was the limit. This was the second time that they had crossed the boundaries. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now gave them a ban. He, gave, he sent the Romans to drive them out of the land. And Jerusalem, what was once a Medina, was now reduced to a Qarya. What was once a wondrous, glorious city, Al-Quds, was now reduced to a Qarya. And this is the ban. Until when? The prophecy is given. Until they are fully released. Until they are let go. Let go from where? From the barrier that was holding them in place. When they are released, these people will now start coming back to that land from whence they were banned. And this return began going way back to the 8th, 9th century after Islam. It started with the Crusades. It progressed from the Crusades to the different ages that transpired after that. Until you finally had the Zionist movement coming about in the 18th and the 19th century. And by 1948, the state of Israel was established. Allah says on that, وَاقْتَرَبَ الْوَعْدُ الْحَقُّ فَإِذَا هِيَ خَاشِعَةٌ فَإِذَا هِيَ شَاخِسَةٌ أَبْسُعَرُ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا يَا وَيْلَنَا قَدْ كُنَّا فِي غَفْلَةٍ مِنْ هَذَا بَلْ كُنَّا ظَالِمِينَ He says, and when the promise of Allah is going to come true, and that promise is reflected in Dhul Qarnain's final journey, he speaks of this promise. When that promise comes true, then the sights of those who disbelieved in this matter will be lifted. And that's when they will realize war unto us. If only we had paid attention because this was said, this was spoken about. We paid no attention to this matter. And now look at the state of the world we are in today. Where are the Muslims? Where are the Arabs? Because the Prophet wasallam said, Wailun lil Arab. Woe unto the Arabs. Min sharin qatik taraba. Of something grave that has taken place. Min sharin qatik taraba. Of something grave that has taken place. That a hole has been made in the barrier of Gog and Magog. Meaning the process of their release already took place during the Prophet's time. And the release has been taking place piece by piece by piece until 1948. A sign that we have continuously missed. 
Now the epistemology has to be revisited from the Quran to understand, are we correct in our estimation that this is indeed true, that the link between the Jews and Gog and Magog has already been established and the historicities are more than evident. It begins with their questioning and the fundamental question asked to their questioning is, why did they ask about Dhul Karni? What was, what was, what were they expecting to hear? What information did they want from the Prophet And this is embedded in that one ayah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala repeats the question. He says, وَيَسْأَلُونَكَ عَنْ ذِي الْقَرْنَيْنِ And they question you, O Muhammad, about Dhul Karnayn. قُلْ Say unto them, سَأَتْلُوا عَلَيْكُمْ I am going to the tilawa, I am going to give you the tilawa of this, I am going to tell you about him. Minhu, about him. And he uses the word dhikra. Something that you seem to have forgotten. I'm going to tell you something about him. This is what you wanted. This is the information you were looking for. Here it is. Let's see what you're going to do about it now. This is him giving it to them. Allah is unfolding the moment for them. That the release of Gog and Magog is now going to take place because it became explicitly clear that the Jews were not going to accept Islam when the Prophet migrated to Medina. This is when the revelation of Dhul Karnayn came about. It became plain and clear that they were not going to accept the Prophet ﷺ. And a lot of changes took place. A lot of changes, a lot of naskh took place in the rulings of the Sharia because otherwise it would have been a harmonization of the foundations of the Torah, Judaism and its transformation now into a bigger religion, Islam. But the division now had to be put in place. The Qibla was changed from what was Jerusalem to now Mecca. The ruling of fasting was changed. A lot of the punishment of adultery was changed. Many things took place. The actual Sharia and its establishment that we have come to know today took place when it became clear that the Jews are a clear enemy to the rest of the world, not just the Muslims, the, the entirety of the world. And this is where you will find the, the deviousness of the Jews. They will use whoever they want to use. Even Gog and Magog, who are mentioned in their scriptures, that are an enemy to the Jews as well. But they will use them to achieve their means. And then they will discard them when it is no longer favorable to them. So now Allah describes Dhul Karni. In a very short and simple statement, he says, And that is his only description. And if that is his only description, then it is foolish to try and figure out who Dhul Karnayn was. Was he Cyrus the Great? Was he Alexander the Great? Was he this one the Great or that one the Great? It doesn't matter. It does not matter. I've given a full disposition of this in my book, the three questions you will have to read and look at all the different theories that are presented. And I have refuted all of those theories from the Quranic perspective. It doesn't matter who he was, whether he had a crown with two horns or wh whatever he was. Dhul Karnayn is a title and the title descriptive is from the Hadith. This is f Islamic epistemology. Before you look at the books of history, you have to look at the Hadith. And the Prophet has described that he went to the two Qarn, to the two limits of human civilization, which are also described in the Quran as it is, as the story unfolds. And he was a man whose actions impacted two ages. What he did at that time is also going to affect this age. Because the barriers are being lifted piece by piece. Every breakthrough that these people are looking for is an attempt to break down that barrier until those barriers are lifted completely. We're going to look at again later on after when we come to the third journey of Dhul Karnayn. What did Allah mean when he said, وَهُمْ مِنْ كُلِّ حَدَ بِنْ يَنْسِلُونَ What does that, حَدَ بِنْ يَنْسِلُونَ, what does it mean? There are many contemporary scholars who have made incredible statements regarding this particular matter, but alas, unfortunately, they have just been uh, ignored. 
But the key descriptive Allah is giving the same way He gave Al Khidr. He's saying, Wa atina hu min kulli shay'in sababa. And we established Him. Inna makana lahu fil ardi. We established Him in the land. And we gave Him from everything a means to accomplish His goals and objectives. Whatever goals and objectives he wanted to accomplish, he gave him the means. The same applies to every other individual, to every human being. You have been given the means. You have to use the means, which is why he repeats constantly. So he followed a means. Again, he repeats after every journey, he repeats that. Why does he repeat that? Because the means themselves are also tested. Every accomplishment after the means are also tested and he is tested each step of the way so that he can arrive at the ultimate place whereby he can do this monumental fiat, an action that affects not just the two ages, but all the ages from that point onwards. The historicities unfold when there is a pivotal event in the human, in the timeline of human history. What is a pivotal event? I'll give you an example. A pivotal event is when, for example, when Nabi Isa was sent to the Jews, that was a pivotal event because it could have gone one of two ways and the historicities would have unfolded accordingly. Had the Jews collectively accepted this prophet as their Nabi, then history would have taken a different turn. You, per you would perhaps not have seen such a thing as Christianity or Western Roman Catholicism. You would perhaps not have seen these unfolding, it would have taken a different turn. Another pivotal event is the arrival of the Prophet Muhammad. Right? These are pivotal events in history that when take place, they lay out the unfolding process and history takes a different course. This is what he did, but how did he arrive at that maqam to be given the honorific title of the one who will change the course of history? It's not just what you hear in the movies or what you see of modern day politicians, individuals who made monumental, uh, had monumental actions that changed how things unfolded from that point onwards. This fella, Dhul Karnain, has been given a very high and honorific title of Dhul Karnain, the one who affected two ages of history. So he followed a means and no one can establish themselves except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is why he says, Inna makanna, we established him. However much you may think yourself as, a, as someone who has the capabilities of establishing yourself, no one establishes you except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You can try and try to the ends of the world. Six ways from Sunday, it's only him who is going to establish you. So what was the first journey that he took? And he followed that means. Until he arrived at Maghrib al-Shams, the setting of the sun. And he found it setting in a murky pond or a, or a dark spring of water وجد عندها قوما and he found thereby a people عين حمية عين doesn't only mean eye it also means spring of water it can mean a vast body of water and حمية is الماء بالتين it's water that has got a that looks like it has been mixed with clay dark waters what the Quran is giving here Amazingly so that a lot of people miss are coordinates, spatial temporal coordinates. You will be given the time by the direction of the setting of the sun and the location, a body of water that has been known to be dark. Again, I'm not going to go into the historicities and the geographies of this matter, but I will tell you definitely and conclusively that this body of water is the Black Sea. And this is historically known throughout to its properties by numerous sailors and, 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 uh, and ships that have tried to navigate the waters of the Black Sea. They are very difficult to navigate. In fact, 
at, at its deepest point, it is said that visibility is, uh, uh, you can only have depth of visibility up to a meter at its deepest point. That is an incredible murkiness of the water. This is the first point of his arrival, due west, where he met a people of water, uh, people by this murky pond. And he found it because this is from his point of view. A lot of people argue, oh, the Quran is scientifically wrong. How can the sun set in water? This is the stupidity of these people. The Arabic is very clear. You don't even need a degree to go that far. Wajadaha, he found it. Taghrubu, setting. Fi aynin hamia. From his point of view, the sun was going down. When you look at the horizon, out in the ocean, due sunset, you find that the sun is going down into the waters. This is what he saw and he was heading west and his point of arrival or his time of arrival was at sunset where he found a people. Now he's going to be tested. He's told, Kulna, we said unto him, Ya Dhul Qarnain, O Dhul Qarnain, Imma antu Adiba, either you punish these people, aw, wa imma anta tahida fihim husna, or you approach them, take them with kindness, with goodness. He's being tested because he's been given the means. What is this test that is being given that he is uh, what is the means that he's being tested by? He's being tested by ilm, by knowledge. Because he's going to apply what Al Khidr applied. He's going to apply deduction. He understands who these people are. What is their status? What kind of individuals are they? And he is now going to implement accordingly because he has been given power as well. It's very easy for him to raise the entire city to the ground and conquer it and take over it. Look at the split between ideologies. What has modern West done comparatively? Every land that the Brits set out, they set out to conquer. They tortured, they persecuted, they ruined. It is the same ideology that the Jews are applying in the Holy Land. You'll see this again in the next journey, uh, further elaborated. He is exerting his knowledge as the suburb because he's saying, he said, Qala, Amma man dhalama, for the one who is unjust, Fasofa we I will we will punish them. Thumma yuraddu ila Rabbihi, and then he will be returned to his Lord. Fayu'adhibuhu adhab nukra and his Lord will punish them with an even greater punishment. And then he says, Wa amma man amana, and as for the one who is righteous, uh, who, who believes, who is a believer, wa amila swalihan, and performs righteousness. As he's, he's a righteous person. Falahu jaza anil husna. For him will be a great reward, a goodly reward. Wasanakulu lahu min amrina yusra. And we will speak to them from our command, from our affair with ease. How does he actually come to establish this? Because as an individual, you need to know, you need to understand. Who is righteous and who is dhalim? How do you apply that? What is the litmus test? What is the stencil to figure out who is what? This is the ahkam. This is the hukm, justice. You need to know the sharia. You need to know the fiqh in order to apply judgment on, an, on, a, on a given people. And choose between who is righteous and who is not. Who is right and who is wrong. And then you give each one his due. This is the test of knowledge, knowing how to apply that knowledge. It is not just about the learning of the knowledge. It is knowing how you will apply that knowledge. And only thereafter, when he has successfully implemented this, when he has successfully distinguished between the two and chosen to, instead of doing what the British did, Historically, when you look back, because we are going to trace back Yajuj and Majuj to see who they are. Genealogically, you will see this embedded in their descriptive, in their genes. What did the British do? What did the Italians do? What did the French do? What did the Germans do when they decided to go out and expand their kingdoms and their empires? 
They did the exact opposite of this. Whoever opposed them, they wiped them out and colonized them. The idea of colonization. Dulkarnain is not con is not focused on colonization. He doesn't care about colonization. He wants to establish justice, and that is the true Khalifa of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. When Allah tells Dawood alayhi salam, as far as the Holy Land is concerned, Ya Dawood, inna jaalna ka Khalifa tan fil ard. Fahkum bain al nas bil haq. Judge between the people with truth. You cannot know the truth if you don't have the knowledge. But that is the impetus of a righteous leader. And Dhulkarnain is the embodiment of a righteous leader. Thumma atba'a sababa. The thumma there is indicative that it took place after some time. It is not fa atba'a sababa as the first ayah. Means that there was time that played out until he had fully accomplished his task. And then he followed a means, another means. Now he, that was one extreme of the land, where there were there was a civilization of civility that had the two extremes within that civili civility, the transgress the transgressors and the ones being transgressed upon, the oppressors and the ones being oppressed, and he established the balance and brought equality among them. Then comes the second journey. Hatta ida balaga matli ashams until he arrived at the rising of the sun. Now, wajadha tasluhu ala qomi lam najal lahum min dunya sitra. He found it rising over a people whom we had not provided from us any shelter or clothing. The satr. The satr is like a barrier between the sun and, and the being. So it, it is denoting either they did not have any clothing themselves as a barrier between themselves and the sun or any shelter. What it ultimately denotes is that these were a primitive people, a very subsistent people living on the bare minimum. And he is tested. Now his power is tested because he is the one with the army and the strength to conquer. And these are the people who are easily subjugated to him. Look now at what the British did when they went to India, when they went further east, when they went to Africa. Whom did they meet? They did not meet big, big civilizations. There were some empires and kingdoms in Africa, but for the large part, whom did they meet? What, what did they do when they arrived at the eastern shores of the Americas? of South America, of North America, what did they do? Because they met the exact same kind of people whom from their point of view are primitive. So we need to educate them. We need to teach them our ways. We need to bring civility to them. We have to show them that eating with your hand is, is, is ape-like behavior. We have to show them how to use the fork and knife. This is what the British did. This is their ideology. Dhulkarnain is tested with the same means because they were given the means, they had the power. What did he do? And this is where you marvel at the Quran and the, and the language of the Quran. He uses so few words to say so much that it is phenomenal. All he says is, Kadalika. Kadalika. Like that. Likewise. That's it. Kadalika. Like that. وَقَدْ أَحَتْنَا بِمَا لَدَيْهِ خُبْرًا And we knew all that we needed to know about him. That's it. كَذَلِكَ Meaning what? He left them as they were. He did not interfere with their lives. He did not try to teach them. He did not try to civilize them because he recognized the power of Allah there before his own power. This is where power is tested. We will trace back Ya Juj and Majuj, because the Prophet ﷺ did say that Ya Juj is an Ummah of Bani Adam and Majuj is an Ummah of Bani Adam. They are human beings and they are living side by side with us Muslims, Christians and Jews and all other peoples in this world, which means they are, we are interacting with them. We have to endure, there is no barrier between us anymore. 
The evidence is very clear from the prophetic tradition and the Quran that the barrier has been removed. I will see exactly how it was removed, how it was physical barrier. There are still ideological barriers that hold them back. And it is why we are still able to sustain ourselves. But when those barriers are lifted completely, how are they lifted completely? Then we have to be concerned. But we cannot wait for that to transpire. We have to establish ourselves now by the means that Allah has given us so that we can follow those means. The same way Dhul Karnain followed those means, the same way Al Khidr followed the means given to him, the same way that every enlightened individual in human history has followed the means to reach an end. Right? So we're going to stop there, inshaAllah. Rabbana taqabbal minna inna ka anta sami'un alim wa tub alayna ya maulana inna ka anta tawabu rahim bi rahmatika ya arhamar rahimin barakallahu fikum wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.